We've been experiencing a severe deficit of critical and logical reasoning skills and thinking lately. So for the classic interview today, we're going to go back to December 5th of 2011, where we spoke to Dr. Christopher DiCarlo. He's an advisor and fellow of the Society of Ontario Free Thinkers. He wrote a really good book, which I've read uh, called uh, How to Become a Really Good Pain in the Ass. And he talks about critical thinking. I still recommend his book as a really great thing to take a look at. We are running into this when it comes to climate science very, very much vaccine science, even with regard to gay rights, teaching evolution in schools, et cetera. We need to be thinking way more critically than we are as a country. And this interview with Christopher DiCarlo is still one of the most interesting along these lines. Let's check it out. Dr. Christopher DiCarlo is with us. He's a fellow advisor and board member of the Society of Ontario Free Thinkers and the Center for Inquiry in Canada. He's also a past visiting research scholar in the Stone Age Laboratory at Harvard University. Uh, Dr. DiCarlo, I have the book How to Become a Really Good Pain in the Ass, A Critical Thinker's Guide to Asking the Right Questions. I've read a bunch of it. I'm actually going to take it with me on a flight next week and hope hope to finish the whole thing. I'm fascinated by it because in the U.S. there's a lot of discussion about are people thinking critically about so many different issues. Politics is kind of the obvious one, but then we also get into discussions of when religion comes into play, are people for some reason choosing not to think critically or are they unable of critical thinking when they are clouded by some some of the teachings of religion. Now, you're an atheist and you also consider yourself a critical thinker. So I'm mm -hmm. curious whether you think that both of those are uh, linked in some kind of obvious way or if they just happen to come together, religion and lack of critical thinking in some cases. Uh, it can. It doesn't have to always be that way, but it certainly it does get in the way. And you, you see this with like Fox and Friends. You see it... Um, in a number of other cases where you know when people answer what I call the big five, you know, the, the biggest questions we can ask about ourselves, and when they, when they answer them supernaturally, you tend to think, well, okay, how do those answers trickle down and affect the way they answer other questions that deal with social policy and other political aspects of, you know, day-to-day -day life within any given population? So you talk about the big five questions, and those are what can I know, why am I here, what am I, how should I behave, and what is to come of me. So these are questions that for a lot of people, the answers are in religion, uh, many, many different religions around the world, but for many people, the answers there are in religion. Do you say that the answers to all five of those questions are, in, are based in science? What are they based in? Well, in the book, what I do is I, I look at how people can answer them naturally, or supernaturally and then I just kind of put it out there and and say where do you fall uh, with these answers do you try to reconcile the natural with the supernatural uh, do you chuck out the supernatural it's not a, an aspect of your life that you particularly need uh, are you predominantly a supernaturalist and um, you abide more by the teachings and words of specific texts and people and, and experiences and so on and so forth the fact of the matter is uh, science has in many ways been not so much undermining religious uh, answers to those questions, but certainly given us a lot of uh, reasons to you know, reconsider how they have been answered in the past and, and to what extent they're relevant today. Is this more of a training issue? In other words, is it a matter of not being taught how to think critically about things? Is it a lack of aptitude? I mean, what, what is it really that you see in most people who, who are not exhibiting the type of critical thinking you outline in the book? Right. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm somewhat biased in favor of critical thinking. I'll, I'll make no, no, uh, no pretensions against that. But, yeah, the fact of the matter is when kids come to school in, in kindergarten grades 1 to 12, we assume they know how to think. But the fact of the matter is there are rules for having discussions, for thinking, for making your case, presenting arguments. And when you violate some of these rules, uh, we have the capacity, we have these tools that say, hey, wait a minute, hang on. Um, no, you can't quite get away with that unless you do some, some more work here. And the fact of the matter is, when it comes to answering those big five in a supernatural way, what happens is that gets embroiled within a cultural context. And if it becomes, say, uh, you know, enshrined within some kind of religious dogma, 
then politically, a lot of people say, well, you know what, we have to respect that, you know, it's it's their religious beliefs and, and we speak in kind of hushed tones about these sorts of things. Now, I have no problem uh, with constitutional rights for freedom of religion, absolutely none. You can pray to flying squirrels for all I care, it doesn't matter to me. What matters is when those answers are put into actions and they affect the lives of other people don't necessarily belong to the same club that answers the big five in that same way. Yeah, I mean, do you think do you think that there's a, is, is there a possible joint uh, is there a possible coexistence of both religion and critical thinking at the level you're talking about, or or can they simply not exist together? They can exist, but it is a delicate balancing act, and what has to happen is a basis of understanding that there's a difference between having belief in certain things and then taking into action what follows or is entailed, logically entailed, by those beliefs. So, it really comes down to what I call, it's in the book, the, to the tolerance harm inverse proportion law. So, you, 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 me, everybody else, we can tolerate people's beliefs and people's actions, provided they're not generating harm or considerable harm or perceived harm to our species or, or other species. Once that level of harm starts to rise, then our level of tolerance then dips. And there's going to be an intersecting point where harm and tolerance are inversely proportional. When harm rises, tolerance lowers. And it's at that intersecting point where we would say, as philosophers, as critical thinkers, I think we have a moral obligation now to say something about it and perhaps physically do something about it, where we disagree because harm is being generated by these views and these actions. What areas in the U.S. specifically do you see that, that, that the, the tolerance seems to be too high for lack of critical thinking? Uh, is it specifically on issues around politics? Is it around science and, of course, discussions of evolution versus intelligent design? I mean, where, do you, where are you most concerned with it? The two areas that I'm most concerned with and have been throughout my life, one costing me a job, uh, was on human origins, discussions about human origins, and where science clearly demonstrates we are the descendants of African apes. A uh, great many people have trouble with this because they perceive themselves to be specially created and that we are not on the same level as, as other primates. So that's why I've created this shirt. You know, back in 2005, I was fired for writing We Are All African on, on, on the board in a critical thinking class. And I said, now why would Darwin and others maintain that, that this is a true statement? And what reason would we have to doubt this? And I was taken to task by a couple of, of uh, students, one Aboriginal and one Christian, who felt that my views uh, offended their particular worldviews. Human origins is certainly a big one, and of course, uh, homosexuality is, is, is another one, and the fact that um, I'm, I'm Canadian, so I have the privilege of looking down at Americans, of course, because we're perfect in every way. <laughs> and um, when I see people like Michelle Bachman and, and her husband, uh, Marcus Bachman, who's into things like reparative therapy for gay men, you know immediately that the way he has answered the Big Five supernaturally has now affected the way he acts in life and is affecting the lives of other people. So, he's not just believing this stuff, he's acting on this stuff. My information that I've compiled over the years maintains fairly clearly that homosexuality is not a life choice, it's who you are. It's, you were born that way, you're no different from any heterosexual person, so in fact Sexuality is amoral, that is to say, you can't morally judge a person's sexuality since they don't choose it. They are simply born that way. Now you can see how I've answered the Big Five and the way in which it trickles down and affects the way I see the world versus, say, a, a Dr. Marcus Bachman and the way he sees the world. So now we put it on the table and say, okay, who's right? What are we using to measure correctness? What are we us using to measure you know who who gets who has the better argument here and why 
Absolutely. And I, and I wish we had more time because the next question I want to get to is how how might we, in your mind, move away from such a situation, particularly in the U.S. And I know you live in Canada, where so much of, of all politics and news and everything really is based around religion and often lack of critical thinking. The book is How to Become a Really Good Pain in the Ass. The author and our guest has been Dr. Christopher DiCarlo. It's been a pleasure and would love to have you back. Well, thank you very much.